So hi, uh, Bahra, thanks for joining me. Hi, Tom, thanks for having me. You're welcome. So um, I'm with my friend Bahra Saleh, who is an Iraqi Kurd, who, who we've been friends for a number of years. And Bahra is speaking to me from Kirkuk in uh, northern Iraq. It's the disputed town uh, sort of in between uh, Baghdad governed Arab Iraq and the independent northern Kurdish, Kurdish regional um, region. Um, all right, we're, we're in the, we've, most of the world's been in a kind of coronavirus lockdown for more than two months now. Is there also, is that the case in, in Iraq too? Yes, for sure. We've been quarantined and locked down for 65 days, I would say, mm. as of now. Uh, it has both pros and cons. Uh, it's good time that we are back to the families, but I think by now it's getting a bit too much. We all want to have a normal life back. Yes. So, uh, but yeah. yeah, so it's pretty much the same as everyone else in the world. Although I should point out, even before you begin, that I, we, we met each other indeed when I visited uh, Solomonea in, in Iraqi Kurdistan. And a lot of people in the West have total stereotypes, at least about, uh, at least of, regarding the Kurdish area, it's totally wrong in Solomonea. And when you say going back to a normal world, there are bars and restaurants and cafes and shopping centers and so on. And it's not yeah. that different than, than Europe, a bit hotter, but it's not that different. So uh, going back to normal world is pretty much much like the Europeans also probably want to end the lockdown and, and return to normal. Anyway, let's just, I want to ask you a bit about your life. So, Para, tell me first of all, wh where, when were you born and tell me a bit about your family. Yes, I just turned 30 years old actually, a couple of months ago. Uh, I am the eldest of four, two brothers and one sister. I was born in the city of Kirkuk. Uh, I was only one year old when my family, along with hundreds and thousands of other families, Kurdish families in Kirkuk, got dismissed uh, from the hometown due to the ethnic cleansing, Arabization process happening during Saddam's time. And just of course, the people, same. Just to remind people, people, uh, Saddam Hussein, who was essentially a Sunni Arab Ba'athist nationalist, waged a war a brutal war against the Kurdish people in Iraq, which of course also there was deaths and, and, and even the use of chemical weapons, chemicals. were part of the refugee movement your family were from Saddam 30 years ago. 30 years ago, definitely. And at the same year, 1991, we had the Kurdish uprising happening in, in Kurdistan region. And then uh, that's when the mass Kurdish immigration started in 1991, when all of us headed to the Kurdistan part of Iran. And then with my family, Iran, uh, Iran, 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 Iran yeah. yeah. Over, the border, over the border from where you are in Kirkuk. Exactly, yeah. Saddam's army, yeah. Yes, it was thousands of us. And we headed to uh, the Kurdish city named Mariwan. Uh, on the border, near the border of uh, Kurdistan. And then we stayed a couple of months there, and then the peace process started between the Kurdish and uh, the federal government of Saddam, and then we returned back to Kurdistan. But at the time when we returned back, we, had, we lost everything in Kirkuk, and my family couldn't have a, a restart in Kirkuk, so we resettled in Suleimani as displaced families. So did, did some sort of Arab settlers take over your family home in Kirkuk? And Kurdish. Yes, okay. yes. This is when the Arabization process were at the max uh, in Kirkuk. And then we resettled in Suleimani as IDP family, displaced family from Kirkuk. We spent 15 years in Suleimani. My mom started teaching Arabic in school and she continues being for the past 27 years. She's teaching Arabic in, 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 elementary in school. Suleimania. Yeah. In Suleimania. And then my dad started working in mechanical department in a cement factory in Suleimania. Uh, and then I spent almost my whole childhood and teenage life in uh, Suleimania until the fall of Saddam. And then in 2005... Just sorry, to interrupt, sorry to interrupt, for those people who have, I mean, I've been there, we've, you've shown me around, but for people who don't know, Suleimania is more an entirely Kurdish town, or almost entirely, that's further north near the Iranian border, Kikuk, 
where you were born and where your family's from is south from Sulaymaniyah and, and has a lot of oil, which is probably one reason Saddam wanted to, to grab it. So, so he, the Kurds, his traditional Kurdish city, were pushed out. Um, although right now you're, you're back in Kirkuk, you're speaking to me from Kirkuk. But anyway, sorry to interrupt if you continue. No, it's okay. Uh, yes, I mean, uh, then my, my parents decided, yeah, it's, it's time to return home. And then uh, we returned to Kirkuk in 2005. I only finished the last two uh, grades of high school. It was in 2007, October, when I got uh, enrolled in the American University of uh, Iraqi Suleimani again. So I only spent three years of my life in Kirkuk. Uh, and then uh, when I graduated from high school, I got the highest uh, score in humanities. I got 97.5 all over Iraq. So wow. I got fully funded scholarship in the American University. Yes, I know, because the American University of, of Iraq was set up, I guess, by the Americans who were in Iraq by then, and Saddam was no longer in power, of course. And um, you got a scholar, you're one of, I think they just took 40 students, of which only a few, like seven, were women, and you got the top grades in high school, pretty much in the whole of Iraq, which is why you got a scholarship to the yes. American University. Well done, you. Thank um, you. <laughs> Um, so how, how did you how did you enjoy the university? Did you get a lot out of it? Yes, I'm actually grateful for the university. The university, as you rightfully said, it was a cooperation establishment between the Americans and the Kurdish Authority, established in, in 2007. And I was I, I think the seventh student, if I'm not wrong, we were about only 40 students in a very small camp, and then the campus was, you know. Uh, enlarged in uh, later 2011. So the university they opened a lot of doors for me and it gave me the tools to access the outside world actually. It got me the English language. Mm -hmm. um, and also it taught me uh, a lot of liberal democratic values, how to be independent, how to accept differences from other cultures and other people around well, the world. Were, professors, were your teachers American or foreign or Kurdish? Or Iraqi. The majority of them were Americans. We had Canadians. We had, but the majority were American. We also had Kurdish teachers as well. But the majority were foreigners and uh, Americans. Yes. Um, as I said, I'm, I'm grateful for my history at the American education, but it also, uh, when I think back, I think it taught us a lot of Americanism, a lot of. American values, too much of capitalism. Mm. Uh, and I, it took me a couple of years to unlearn certain stuff that were theologically not uh, in peace with me. What were you studying? Which subjects exactly? I studied international studies and uh, as a major and English literature as a minor. Wow. Uh, English literature is a subject. <laughs> yeah. Mm. So, uh, they taught us about American dream where outside of the walls of the university dreaming was not allowed or mm. suppressed. Mm. So that was the irony, that was the contradiction I was facing while I was in the university. They taught us that we are special, we are talented and nobody else is like us. And then uh, it, it ended up in a way that... Yeah, yeah. The American it ended up, courage, yeah, yeah. Yeah, sorry. I think it ended up in a way that instead of creating a, dis a, a unity with my own society, it led to a disconnect. Because by the time I graduated, I felt like, okay, my values are very much different now from the rest of the communities. So, uh, yeah, and that was my experience at the American. At that point, you, I mean, you've never been to America. I, don't, I think you told me when we, one of the times we met, that you've you, you have, you've still never been to America. Right? Or have you I've been, never been to America. You no. felt like you've been Americanized in in Kurdistan, but you hadn't uh, visited America. Um, so going back, yes. to, you know, going back to the differences of the local society. Right now is uh, it's towards the end of Ramadan. Yes, and some of the big yes. festivals at the close of yes. Ramadan coming up. How? I mean, look. Again, there are lots of stereotypes, especially with Iraq, from people most people haven't had the opportunity to visit, like, like I have. And um, how is it being, for example, a woman, specifically in Ramadan? Do you, do you, do you fast? Are you, are, you, 
are you forced to fast if you don't want to? What, what's the situation? Generally speaking, Ramadan is an interesting and nice month of Islamic calendar and Islamic culture. Uh, it's a month of praying, fasting and reflections. And it's the month where a lot of charities take place towards the poor families. It's a month where families get together. There's a lot of nice things about Ramadan. I'm personally not fasting. Right. And my family, thank God, they're okay with it. They're open-minded. Uh, but Did relatives they around me... Do your parents fast? Do your parents yes, they do. They do. They do. But they don't intervene in my personal thinking about fasting. Right. And that's... Uh, uh, that's a privilege, actually. Uh, relatives around me, they find it very unusual. And the only thing that I don't like about Ramadan is the social, cultural, religious stigmatization around the people who don't fast. I get this question on a daily basis, do you fast? Okay. And I say, no, I don't. And in the reaction, I, I get uh, a reaction like, ain't you grown up enough to fast? Ain't you adult enough to go fasting to fast? You mean like you're a bad person if you're not fasting? It's a stigmatization around it. You are not usual if you're not fasting. And I think we still have a long time to, to get to that perspective where it's a personal matter. You know, um, a, a Jewish friend of mine on Yom Kippur, the Jewish fast day, I asked him if he, if he fasts and he says, well, just in between meals, I'm not eating. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> You're fasting in between meals. Anyway, That's a good one. this year, of course, with Ramadan, it's also the coronavirus shutdown. So I know it, it complicates the situation a little bit because people have to stay inside and they're fasting. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, Ramadan's a time where you go and visit, uh, visit friends and neighbors and bring them sweets and greetings and so on. So is, is that curtailed at the moment? Yeah, to some extent, of course, due to the lockdown and the movement restrictions between provinces, it's still not allowed. The lockdown was very strict in the beginning, but nowadays it has a little bit eased down, uh, but still travel and traffic in the provinces is highly restricted. Uh, and Ramadan this year is different with the fact that we have a lot of people actually suffering financially. The economy is down. The public because services the are down. Because of the lockdown, some people are... Because, because of the lockdown, and don't forget, we are an oil-rich country. So the price of oil dramatically declined. Yeah, and, the only, and oil revenues is the only revenue we depend on. We are not a multi-agricultural, diversified economy in, in this in the yeah. part of the world. So the economy is really down, a financial crisis on the way, and then the Kurdistan regional government uh, failed to pay civil servant salaries. It was only yesterday when they paid the first civil servant salaries in the calendar of 2020. So you lock down people at home, you quarantine them, you and you... Even before the lockdown, it's in 2020. They haven't paid all yes. and we're we in, only We're now in May, so it's almost we're the second half of May, so it's almost halfway through the year. Exactly. No, no. The, the issue with the salary started when Kurdistan region started to independently export the oil. Mm -hmm. And that created the uh, dispute between Baghdad and Erbil. And then from that, it's happened back in 2013, I would, mm -hmm. if I remember correctly, when the salary issue started. And now, with this kind of lockdown that we have, I can see around the people that there's an issue of trust. Compared to the rest of the world, luckily we don't have many cases. We only have around 450 cases, and most of us. COVID 19 of the coronavirus. You don't yes. We don't have many cases compared to neighboring countries like Iran, for instance, mm -hmm. like Europe. We only have around 450 cases, and 95% uh, of them have been recovered. But then now it's this impression from the communities and the societies that there is no trust anymore between. The cases they report. Sorry, what, why is why is why do you think the cases are lower in Iraq than in some other country, European in Europe, for example? I don't know. There are many perceptions around it. There are many kind of understandings around it. First of all, we started the lockdown very early. We closed the border with Iran, okay. and that may be a, a good uh, reason why it's not that high. <laughs> Second, <laughs> just to remind people, sorry, that Iran was one of the earliest places with a big outbreak, partly because 
Iranian officials were actually going to Wuhan in China because they have military and other projects that was brought back directly from Wuhan to Iran, then Iraq closes the border with Iran so it does not spread from Iran into Iraq. Sorry. Definitely. And then, sorry, Definitely. Go. And I can I hear from news that Iranians are very much pushing the Iraqi authorities to open the border, but Iraq has disagreed to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, that might be one of the reasons. Another reason might be uh, the weather. It's really hot in here. And well, it's uh, with hot weather. It's harder for both. Exactly. And uh, I don't know, maybe we have a lot of cases, but we don't have enough testing. That's also another aspect of it. Maybe we have a lot of thousands of cases, but the government don't want to share the correct data with us. Could, could it be, I think when we've spoken before uh, in past times, you, um, you, the health system in Iraq is relatively good and you are, a lot of children are inoculated against all kinds of stuff, malaria, other stuff, and maybe you get more drugs than a child in Europe would, and maybe whatever that basket of medicines is, is making it harder for the coronavirus to catch on. That's for sure might be another reason. We get a lot of vaccines when we're a child, you know. Uh, I cannot recall all the names of these vaccines. It's the several of uh, types of vaccines we get. Better, better not to remember them. <laughs> yeah, uh, but uh, that might be another reason, actually. We, our immunity system uh, is maybe uh, uh, stronger than... Tell me, when, when I was in Solomon Air, um, which is which is the town you normally live in, but you're just spending because of Ramadan, you're in Kirkuk with your parents in the lockdown, but you're normally, what is it, about an hour's drive north or uh, north uh, towards the yeah. Iranian border. I was very, I liked Solomon a lot. Um, I thought it was quite a, in, at least the centre was almost European in the sense it was clean and there was that amusement park that we went to and had that picnic with a, with a, with a group of friends of ours and we had nice dinners, great food. We went also with friends to the uh, that skyscraper hotel, the revolving restaurant where it moved yes. round and round. The restaurant, yeah. What's the name of that restaurant? 360 restaurant, Grand Millennium Hotel, yeah. 360, because it's moving around. And you had great views, of course, of the beautiful mountains around Kurdistan with light and so on. Anyway, how, you know, are you, I know you've spent time also in, in Sweden um, as an adult, not, not as a child. And, and we, of course, have met at conferences in Europe, in, in, in Central Europe. So when we've met at conferences in Europe, a group of us from the conference have gone out to an Indian restaurant one year, another year, I think we went to a, a kind of upmarket European cuisine on, on the river, beautiful terrace. But I have to say, I really like the Iraqi Kurdish food I had that I think your your mum's friend, was it, who prepared for all of us? Delicious. But but that's yeah. me as an outsider. How maybe I'm looking at Sulemanea and slightly rose-tinted views. And also I'd come to Sulemanea from Erbil, which is the kind of capital of Iraqi Kurdistan. And I preferred Sulemanea to Erbil. Erbil was a bit more conservative, a bit more gritty, the architecture was not so nice as in, for, in my eyes as Sulmanea, you have these beautiful mountains around Sulmanea, but am I being maybe too rose-tinted or do you, would you prefer Sulmanea to the European cities or to Sweden or places you visited? Oh, well, it's a hard question actually, it's not about preferences. Going back to the food, of course, I like Kurdish food and I grew, I grew up with cooking Kurdish food and with Kurdish food, but I really, really enjoy international food. Indian food is my favorite, for instance. Mexican, Chinese, Lebanese, uh, Turkish food. Are, are there Mexican, me Mexican and Chinese restaurants in Kurdistan or not really? We do have uh, Indians, we do have, yes, we do have uh, Chinese, Bali, yeah, yeah, we do have uh, kind of a diverse. Uh, cuisine in Suleimani in, in Kurdistan region. Living in Sweden, uh, I got to Sweden the first time when I got to my master's program in 2013. I studied in Lund University. I got a fully funded scholar from the EU government. Uh, it was a quite eye-opening experience for me. But uh, I got to a feeling of confusion, where is home? Where where, the, where feels home? Uh, in Kurdish, we had to, we have a, a metaphor saying, when you are used to two types of water, 
none of them will break the first the first anymore. Uh, so it's it, it's kind of the same feelings that I have in Sweden. Sweden is I enjoy living in Sweden. It's a lot more freedom, democratic, and uh, I like certain aspects of the culture. But I will be considered a black hair immigrant even if I become a grandma in Sweden. So uh, the Swedes, I don't know if maybe racism is the right word, but they're a little bit xenophobic somehow. Or you're, you're, you would be regarded as an outsider or by the Swedes, or you yourself won't really want to become Swedish, even if you could. You would prefer to, you, you are Kurdish and you have no, no possibility, even if you wanted to, of not feeling Kurdish. Actually, I, I'm married to a Kurdish-Swedish citizen right now. And uh, the reason why I really liked a I chose him is because he did not lose, lose his Kurdish identity. No. So it's, I can never lose my identity living in Sweden, even if I become a 90 year old in Sweden. I prefer to res preserve my own cultural identity and values as a Kurdish. However, I'm very much open to integrate into the Swedish society because I like a lot of their cultural values, but I, it does not necessarily mean that I accept all of them. But there's also Swedish Democrats, uh, one of the places uh, political parties in the parliament uh, who spread racism and xenophobia. They're, so, they're very misnamed. They're called the Swedish Democrats, but they're almost, you know, they, they probably would be closer to being fascists than Democrats or racists. They're yes. Not, they're not, it's, it's one of those propaganda things. It's like a communist newspaper used to be called Truth because we know it didn't tell the truth. So, so uh, but, but Barry, just to finish off, um, you know, I have a lot of Kurdish friends. The Kurds are the largest people in the world without their own country, their own state. 40 million people in Iraqi Kurdistan, where you're from, where you are now. Also, of course, Turkish, Turkish Kurdistan, Iranian Kurdistan, Syrian Kurdistan. Yes. We know that in Syria, the Kurds carved out some autonomy for themselves during this brutal civil war that's been happening in Syria but they're now being squeezed between the, the Russian and Iranian forces and Assad's forces and so on. What, I mean, do you have any fee hopes for the Kurd, Kurdish people as a whole? They're, they're, they're the biggest people of a world in the world without their own state. There are at least 130 peoples in the world that don't have a country, that would like to have a country, but the Kurds are by far the largest numerically of these people. They have their own language, have your own language, your own territory, um, your own rich history, different from the Arabs, different from the Turks, different from the, the Persians, the Iranians, and so on. So do you have you know, hopes for the Kurdish future, let's say? What a question, Tom. <laughs> it's a small question to finish up. Of course, I'm positive. I'm hopeful. Uh, without hope and positivity, we cannot get anywhere. Uh, that's set aside. However, when we say Kurdish independence, we have to be specific whether we mean uh, north of Iraq or the whole parts of the Kurdistan, including Turkey, Syria, and Iran. And that's when the question comes about. When we had the uh, independence referendum, that was only for the north of Iraq. And uh, it was a big thing, unfortunately. Just remind people, there was a referendum a couple of years ago just on the Kurdish, Iraqi part of Kurdistan. And I yes. think an overwhelming majority said yes, 90 something, 98% or something. And yet, almost no one in the world, no other country recognized this, even though no one disputed that the, the referendum was fair, no one cheated or something like that. It was a proper referendum. And I, for one, thought it was very disappointing that the whole world basically just ignored this democratic exercise. We did not have the backing of the international community for sure. But I would also say internally, we also mismanaged the referendum. Uh, that's uh, something that I feel so disappointed about. And we could have worked a lot better on getting international support for our referendum. But due to Kurdish interconflict inside Kurdistan region, we failed to manage and receive that international support uh, from the international community. And the timing was uh, a bit miscalculated, I would say. Uh, 
a state is only meaningful and sustainable and maintainable when you have an independent economy, when you have your people happy with you. But within this part of the world, we have a lot of uh, problems, a lot of injustice. Sure. Uh, people are not very much happy with the leadership, to be honest. We have a family rule here. Uh, it's, I mean, there, there are two main families that kind of carve up Iraqi Kurdistan and have a lot of political power in each in their own part, if I'm putting it crudely, something like that. Yeah, for sure. We have a family rule between two main political parties since the uh, since Christie's actually. Um, so nowadays there has been intra-conflict mm. within these two families forever. Uh, a sense of unity is missing and uh, people across the society are very much polarized politically, socially, uh, ideologically. Uh, so I think the referendum, we could have done a lot better, to be honest. We could well, have done a lot better. Let's hope in the future there will be another opportunity oh. and, and Kurdistan will have a have more international back. We need a right leadership. We need a right leadership to, to well, take care of this referendum. I know that you're not, you don't, uh, I've asked you before, and you're not somebody to go into politics, but if clever people like you go into politics, then there will be a better leadership. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> All right. Thank, Thank you. you very much for joining me today. Thanks um, for having me. That was fun. Yes, good. All right. Take care. Bye. Take care.